Hello, I'm Alice Redgate, a member on Exeter's iGEM team for 2016. Welcome to today's episode of Desert Island Science. To watch more about the iGEM team's journey, you can find our channel by searching for Exeter iGEM 2016 on YouTube. Away today is Professor of Astrophysics at Oxford University, Dr Chris Lintott. Around the time he began his PhD, he was recruited to the Sky at Night team, first as a researcher and then increasingly as a reporter and co-presenter. So welcome Professor Chris Lintott. It's nice to be here, thanks for having me. Can you tell us a bit more about your involvement in the Sky at Night and what's been your highlight during your time there? Sure, I was very lucky to get involved with the programme. I was brought on, as you said, as, as a researcher, somebody behind the scenes who was helping uh, put material together, keeping an eye on the edit to make sure astronomical truth was preserved uh, during the show. But I quickly got thrown in front of the camera and I've had the, the wonderful luck to interview all sorts of people. Um, picking one highlight is really difficult, but uh, I got to talk to Eugene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon. Um, in Mission Control in Houston. Uh, and just hearing him talk about what it was like to be part of the Apollo program and, and what it was like to be in space and what it was like uh, to leave the moon for the last time while surrounded by cigar-stained walls and, and sort of something that looked exactly like you imagine Mission Control to look was, was just really quite something. Um, I think we talked for about four hours and the, the poor producer had to edit it down to about 20 minutes. Uh, but that, personally, that was, that was a wonderful moment. And so was that your first time in front of the camera on Sky at Night? That wasn't the first one. My first one was about the moon as well. There was a British probe called Smart One, which had headed to the moon. And I was at a press conference that got thrown in front, front of the camera. But uh, I, I've really enjoyed it. I don't so much enjoy the sort of walking, talking, pointing at stuff. I'd rather leave that to Brian Cox and, and people who are good at it. But I do like interviewing people. I love um, getting stories out of people, whether that's, you know, the team who've just put a probe into orbit around Juno, uh, around Jupiter rather, or, or, you know, a PhD student with a discovery or a story to tell. So we're here today to find out about your views surrounding synthetic biology, but also to hear about the items you've picked to take with you on the desert island. On the island, you already have a copy of the iGEM registry with access to all the synthetic biology parts and a solar powered bento lab, but you're able to select one other book, one other piece of science equipment, one luxury item and two songs. So tell us about the first song. The first song, this is, a, I'm not sure I'm going to get away with this, but I have good reason. So I would like, please, the entirety of Wagner's Ring Cycle, um, partly because I think I'll need entertaining, so something that lasts about 24 hours and is a wonderfully complex and interesting piece of music would be useful. I'm also a, a big opera fan, but also because the start of the Ring Cycle, at the very beginning of the first opera, um, there is a piece of music that is a representation of the very early universe. So as an astronomer, I think this is mathematically interesting. So what happens is you get a single note and then that becomes more and more complex as more tones are added to it. And usually this is played in the dark. And I can imagine sitting in the dark on a desert island listening to this. Um, uh, and that's exactly what happens in the early universe. We start off with uh, hot, dense material with waves washing through. Uh, and the mathematics you use to describe those waves are exactly the same mathematics you can use to describe the first few minutes of, of the first opera in the ring cycle. So uh, it's for astronomical inspiration, but also I thought I'd pick the longest piece I could imagine listening to again and again, just to make sure I don't get bored. So your day job is as a researcher at the University of Oxford, where you're currently investigating galaxy formation. How did you become interested in this area of science? Well, I'm quite unusual for an astronomer in that I was a, a small kid with a telescope. So I was an amateur astronomer way before uh, it became a job. So I used to go out uh, in, outside my house in Paynton in, in South Devon and, and look, at the, look at the stars. Um, and, and that's what inspired me. It was really the idea that you could connect 
an observation of the universe, you know, the, the, the idea that we could stand uh, under a starry sky and wonder whether those stars uh, had planets or, 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 or say something sensible about where they came from, I still find kind of miraculous. I think, you know, you biologists have it very easy in that you can do experiments in the lab and, and you can test your theories that way. Uh, for astronomers, we have to put up with what the universe gives us. And it's that link between observation and understanding that, that really excited me. Um, so, so, so it started from that. My, the school I went to had an excellent telescope. And they, they made the slightly crazy decision to give kids who were interested keys to the observatory. So, so I spent a lot of time um, trying to get this big telescope to do something useful. Um, and, and so it's from there, really. It's, it's a childhood dream. Most astronomers come from physics or mathematics backgrounds uh, and so most of them have never looked through a telescope which I think is deeply depressing uh, but but I still connect looking at the night sky to trying to understand it. And where did you get your first telescope from? I bought my first telescope with um, the profits from a summer spent working in a, a tourist shop on Torquay Harbour Front um, selling ice creams to tourists and <laughs> using that money I bought a second hand um, six inch reflectors as the size of the mirror and I still have it and it's a beautifully unmechanized telescope so it has no drive it has no computer system you have to find stuff in the sky by what we call star hopping going from star to star and I, and I used it uh, for many years to s sketch what was happening on Jupiter uh, and occasionally on Mars so it's a, it's a beautiful device it's utterly useless for modern scientific work but it's great fun fantastic so tell us about the piece of science equipment you've selected so, uh, I'm, uh, do, do you have a sense of how big the desert island is? I have some questions before I can make my decision. We haven't specified. The idea is that it's remote, so I suppose it's okay. No, that's take. good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and can it be somewhere near the equator? Yeah, if that's the desert island you're choosing. <laughs> Great, right, excellent. In which case, I, I want the James Clark Maxwell telescope, please, which currently sits on Mauna Kea uh, in Hawaii. Um, so we'll move it to a slightly worse observing site. Um, um, but, but the JCMT is a radio telescope. It's tuned to microwaves. Um, and why you care about that, if you're an astronomer, is that microwaves come from molecules in the universe. And so if you want to understand the universe as a physicist, uh, you can observe gas and dust and so on. But if you're a chemist observing the universe, you have much more information. So a lot of my PhD work was looking at uh, molecules around newly formed stars. And you get quite complex chemistry. Um, but to get time on these big telescopes, you have to apply. You have to write a case that says, um, you know, I will use the telescope for three nights and I will do this and I will make this wonderful discovery. So I'm sick of writing proposals. So if I'm going to be on a desert island, I'll take the telescope with me uh, and I want to go back. I've got lots of unfinished questions from my PhD, which was mostly about sulfur chemistry around uh, star, uh, young stars, something that no one else in the world cared about. Uh, and therefore, which I struggled to get time on telescopes. So I'm going to take this telescope, I'm going to put it on my desert island, I'm going to put up with having worse conditions than on Hawaii. Um, but nonetheless, I'm going to observe the sky in the radio. Uh, so no pretty pictures, but my but but I'll have my telescope. That should keep you entertained. Yeah, no, I think it'll keep me busy, at least. I mean, the problem is, I have to say, if I can design my island, I need a mountain as well. Because from sea level, you only detect water. what you really detect is the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason this telescope is on Mauna Kea normally, before I steal it, is that it's high up above the uh, most of the Earth's atmosphere. And so if the, the desert island can have a very tall mountain in the middle, that would be even better. Okay, I'm sure we can arrange that one. <laughs> Um, a large part of our IGEM project is human practices, where we take our project beyond the lab to try and engage the public with science. You run Zooniverse, the largest online platform for collaborative volunteer research, which has a series of citizen science projects covering a wide range of topics across the sciences and humanities. Can you tell us a bit more about this and why you think citizen science is important? Sure. Um, I think citizen so the first thing to say is that citizen science isn't a new idea. If you go back to the 19th century and look at the foundations of my subject, astronomy or, or biology or biological recording or meteorology or any of these subjects, what you find is a bunch of volunteers providing the data. Uh, and it's only towards the end of the 19th century that we get this idea of a professional scientist um, who, who is somebody who's paid to think about these things. Um, but it's had a new lease of life recently because professionals in lots of fields have got 
too good at collecting data. My particular version of this problem um, almost 10 years ago now was that we had images of a million galaxies. And if you have an image of a galaxy, you want to work out what shape it is. That task is something that um, a student can do easily. Um, to be honest, a 10-year-old can do easily, but computers still struggle with sort of that fuzzy pattern recognition. Um, and so what we did was turn to the public for help. I did a website called Galaxy Zoo and got this overwhelming response. At one point, we were doing nearly 100,000 classifications of galaxies per hour. Um, and so we got this huge response, and the public turned out to be pretty good at this. In fact, they were better than a single expert. Uh, and so this was a sort of modern form of citizen science. It's almost the reverse of the old version. Now, professionals or, or robotic observatories collect the data, and then we turn it over to the public to help. Um, and then the other thing that happened was that other scientists started asking whether we could help them talk to the public. And so Zooniverse is a platform for doing that. And we have projects looking for planets, uh, working with ancient papyri, uh, classifying animals in the Serengeti. Uh, there's even a project counting penguins uh, for, for a colleague uh, here in Oxford who, who needs to, who's studying penguin behavior in the Antarctic. So all of these projects are really easy to get started with. Uh, there's a complete range for... For yeah, anybody yeah, yeah, who wants exactly. to get involved. Yeah. yeah so how do you verify that the answers are correct? Well, we have lots of people look at each image, so we have some idea of consensus. And then typically for a project, we have a small number of uh, people looking. So we have a small number of images where we know the answer, either because experts have reviewed them or, or because we, maybe there's a simulated image in there. It's easier to simulate a galaxy than a lion. So for some projects, it, it, it's easier to do simulated images. And so then we compare, and that's a large part of, of what we do. I think it's a really important step because that's what makes the data useful for scientists. Uh, we need to convince uh, our colleagues that this is good data, and we can only do that by, by this sort of verification. Mm -hmm. And how much of your time does this take up? Uh, oh, no more than seven days a week. Uh, yeah, no. So, my, I mean, I, I I don't do much of the work on Zooniverse. There's a there's you can't see it, see from here, but just downstairs, there's a lab full of uh, web developers, educators, and scientists. And there's a similar team in Chicago at the planetarium there who work to build the projects and and the tools for project building. So they do most of the work. What I do is I write grants to bring in money to pay these people. Um, and, and so all of my research time goes into Zooniverse. I still do astronomy, but I do it using the results of these projects. So when I think about galaxies, I'm using project results from this project, Galaxy Zoo, that started it all. Uh, and I've dabbled in, in other projects, like looking for planets as well. So what do you think is the most effective way to get people involved? I think... One of the most surprising things about Zooniverse is that people want to help. So I think uh, as a science communicator, I, I think before I started, I expected to have to work quite hard to get people to help. So the original model for Galaxy Zoo was that I would go and give a talk, say, to an astronomical society, a bunch of amateur astronomers, and say, please help me with my research. And then they'd, they'd go and, and do a little bit. But actually, at least our volunteers, and we've got more than one and a half million of them now, tell us that what they're interested in doing is, is helping science and being part of the adventure. And so, so, so the easiest way to get people to, to participate is to be convincing when you say to them, um, if you help us, we will understand something about the natural world or the universe that we didn't know before. Uh, and I find that it's kind of inspiring that that's enough to motivate people. I don't need to make it an exciting game. I don't need to give you points that you can compete with your friends. I don't need to um, promise you that you might win a trip to the Antarctic, although we've done that too. Um, it's just the idea that, that you might be able to spend a few minutes a day helping scientists that inspires people. Um, as a scientist, that, that's good news, but it's also slightly slightly scary in that then we have a responsibility to report back to these very large collaborations of hundreds of thousands of people and make our results comprehensible. So tell us about the book you've chosen. So uh, this is a physicist showing off, I'm afraid. I'd like a copy of uh, Newton's Principia. Mm -hmm. And why have you chosen this one? Well, I've chosen it because I think it's probably, if, if we're sticking to books, the greatest work of physics. I don't understand much of it. Um, it. It's a beautifully dense book. It wasn't 
Newton didn't really want to publish. He was he was a bit too selfish for that and liked to keep his results to himself. But he was persuaded by Edmund Halley, you know, the man who who traced the comet and had it named after him, that it would be a good thing to write down his results. And so it's this incredibly thick distillation of notes about everything that Newton understands about gravity and about how what, the system of the world works. And so obviously, you know, as part of my physics education, I've learned to do Newtonian gravity. I could, if you give me a lot of time and I can revise my notes from a long time ago, I could probably write down the equations that will get a spacecraft to the moon. But Newton had these really deep insights into how the world worked. And I, I think you could happily spend a lifetime on a desert island picking through Principia, rederiving his results and trying to trace what he was thinking. So it's sort of a physicist's luxury. I'd like the time, um, to, even if I don't have the ability to try and follow what Newton was doing. So let's have some more music. Tell us about your second song choice. Well, it couldn't be much more different, and I can't think of an astronomical link, but um, this is, I want a song called London Town by a band called Bellowhead, who have just stopped uh, playing and and um, it's it's picked for a personal reason really. I I grew up in Devon, which is full of good folk music, and I now live in Oxford, which is the centre of of the English folk tradition. And Bellahead are an Oxford uh, based or were an Oxford based band that took sort of traditional folk music, lots of it found in the Bodleian Library in the university, and then turned it into the kind of thing you can jump up and down at a gig to. So this is to cheer me up. Uh, when I'm un- uh, when, when I'm a bit depressed about being stuck on a desert island, and when my telescope doesn't work and I can't understand any of Newton's Principia, this is I, I will force myself to stand on the beach and, and bounce up and down to this song. <laughs> London City, I made my way up Cheapside. I chose to stray where a fair pretty maid I bet it meet and I greeted her with kisses sweet. I was up to the rigs, down to the jigs, up to the rigs of London Town. I was up to the rigs, down to the jigs, up to the rigs of London Town. Synthetic biology is a relatively new field of research involving a combination of biosciences, physics, engineering, and computer science. How important do you think it is to have a multidisciplinary approach to science research? I think multidisciplinary working is a good way of finding new questions uh, to answer. And that's always the fun thing. So uh, the closest I've got to synthetic biology is in my field where there's a sort of nascent discipline of astrobiology where people are starting to consider what life in the universe would actually be like um, and using insights from astronomers who provide um, sort of the raw conditions. We can tell you what planets are out there, what possibilities are out there, and then biologists who can who can respond to that. Um, and, and I think when it works, bringing those fields together is incredibly exciting. Um, I, it, it's not the only way to do science, of course. One can still be be a straightforward physicist or a biologist, but if you do that, you are missing out on the opportunity to ask new questions. Um, and, and so I think I think it's very exciting. I have to say I know almost nothing about synthetic biology, uh, so so clearly I need to be more interdisciplinary myself and, and, and talk to the right people. So although you say you don't know much about synthetic biology, how do you think it could possibly be used to benefit physics and astrophysics research? Well, the immediate thing that springs to mind is is sort of space travel. Um, uh, and um, you know, if you look at science fiction for inspiration, then um, there are great examples of, of synthetic bacteria being used um, to terraform Mars, for example. If we want to turn Mars into a more Earth-like world, then what you need is is bacteria that can thrive in sort of carbon dioxide rich environments and which might spit out some nice oxygen so that space travelers could could breathe. So I can certainly see the adaptation of organisms to, to live in other worlds to, to be very exciting. Um, I, I'd rather you left Mars alone. I have to say I'm a, I'm, I'm a wilderness uh, preserver uh, in my mind at least. And while I'd love to go to Mars, I, I, I'd rather not build Disney World there. So I quite, I quite like it to stay Mars-like. So, so my challenge to synthetic biologists is this. Um, I really want the human race to be able to travel through the cosmos. I'd like to explore the galaxy properly, but that's really difficult. It takes an awfully large rocket to launch something as heavy as I am off the, off the Earth. Um, and then human lifetimes don't really allow uh, for much exploration if we're stuck at traveling at the speed of light, and we think as physicists that, that we are. So I'd like, please, an, an organism or colony of organisms that can survive uh, 
a trip across the galaxy that would take thousands and thousands of years uh, and yet would be able to do something or sense something when it when it gets there um so so i'll settle for bacteria if we have to go that small but otherwise sort of the ideal organ- organism for very slow spacefaring travel would be great please fantastic so let's hear about the final item you've picked then your luxury item well, I've already talked about it, really, because uh, while the, I've got the JCMT for my professional work on the, on the desert island, I need to be able to look at the stars. And so I'd like the, the reflector that I've been using since I was a kid, please, um, I, and a full set of eyepieces. And I, the, the thing that, that gave me pause was whether I should fit a computerized drive to it. Because I'm very proud of the fact that I know my way around the sky and that I can, I can, I, I can sort of navigate my way around. Um, but I'm going to be in unfamiliar territory. If we're near the equator, then I'll see the southern hemisphere. And I don't know the southern sky at all well. Um, and so, and I, I don't have a star atlas because I've already used my book. So I thought I was going to fit a computerized drive. But then I realized I've got plenty of time. The weather on the desert island is going to be great. And so what I'm going to try and do with this luxury is, is I'm going to try and map the sky. I'm going to make my own discoveries, even if they're things that are well known to, to astronomers. I'm try and try and create my own map of the stars. So how do you think you're going to find living on our desert island? um quiet i think um despite the opera and the bellahead um but 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 i think i'll have plenty to to keep me busy um i don't know how i publish though that's the only problem i think there'll there'll be letters in a bottle with references attached (laughs) so i'm going to cast you away now on our desert island professor chris lintop thank you so much for talking to us today on desert island science my pleasure thanks a lot